Hello, everyone. Welcome to Measuring the Score podcast, the podcast where we offer our opinions on film scores and the films they're inspired by. I'm Chris. And I'm Leslie. Let's get started. Welcome back to Measuring the Score. This is episode 10, and this is our showcase. It's every five episodes we do a composer showcase. So today, we're going to be talking about Danny Elfman. Now, normally, whenever we start this episode, we talk about what have we been listening to. Leslie, have you been listening to anything other than what we were talking about today? No, I've been listening to a bunch of scores related to our showcase. Okay. Well, I have been listening to something, but it also coincides with our composer showcase. So I'm going to mention it later on, which is a little different than what we normally do, normally do. But I'm going to talk about that later on in the in the showcase. But like I said, today we're going to be talking about Danny Elfman. Yay! <laughs> I told Leslie season two we're going to have something different. No, I love that sound. <laughs> makes me happy (laughs) (laughs) you can't change it up yes i can oh so like i said today we're gonna be talking about danny elfman now he was born in 1953 and it makes him 68 years old don't tell me that that makes me sad (laughs) and he's still very active too and he's also very active on social media which is awesome because on Instagram he had a thing where it was him and a ventriloquist dummy and the and the dummy was saying that he was the one pulling on the strings he was the one that created all the music for Danny Elfman not Danny and it was great I loved it and um he like I said he's still a very active composer and uh he was born in Los Angeles and he spent most of his time at a local theater watching films and that's when he started discovering composers like Bernard Herrmann and uh Franz Waxman which Bernard Herrmann was, you know, Hitchcock's composer. And that's kind of interesting because in 1998, Danny Elfman adapted Herrmann's score for the remake, reshoot of uh, Psycho, which uh, Gus Van Sant directed. And then he also scored the uh, biopic Hitchcock, starring Anthony Hopkins. Yeah, he... Um, I read something uh, not too long ago where it said that... Uh he, uh, Bernard Herrmann was one of his major influencers of his scoring. Uh, he really liked his work and that, uh, you know, he grew up watching a lot of the horror and the sci-fi movies, um, which is why he gets along with Tim Burton, he said, because they have the same background. But, um, I regress. He did mention that, uh, Bernard Herrmann was one of his, um, his, uh, major influencers so that makes sense that he he did Hitchcock right and and, and one of the things I remember about Hitchcock the director was very um taken back that Danny Elfman paid for the orchestra himself because it was it was coming toward the end of the 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 film of the budget and they just didn't have the budget to to provide for the orchestra and Danny Elfman went in and you know paid for it himself and that makes sense too because uh he liked to be when he was part of oingo boingo for example uh he mentioned that he liked to be involved in the creative process and he liked to be involved in uh the music videos you know partially writing some of the music videos setting up the scenes so you know in my mind it makes sense that he would um when they couldn't afford the orchestra that he would uh pay for it because you know he loved he, he loves what he does and it's apparent when you start to listen to all of his music right and uh he he you know he he, he grew up with his uh brother richard elfman who is a filmmaker great guy i'm actually friends with him on facebook uh super nice guy little weird taste here or there and fun fact about richard there is a web series called chronic horror that i scored and it was a lot of filmmakers, you know, in the horror genre would come on and smoke weed and talk about different horror films. And Richard Elfman actually came on to the show. So, I, 
you know. I didn't know he was part of that. Yeah, he, he I came, remember he, you working were, on the music for yeah, it. Yeah, it, it was a it was a really fun thing to do because it was a lot of different type of score for me to do. And Richard Elfman was one of the guests that came on there, so that was that was really cool. Uh, now you, you mentioned Oingo Boingo. Um, after returning, now we're getting our information from Wikipedia. Now, after returning to Los Angeles from Africa in the early 1970s, Elfman was asked by his brother Richard to serve as mus- musical director of the street theater performance art trope, The Mystic Knights of the Oingo Boingo. Now, I, you know, doing all the research of Danny Elfman, you know, back in the day, before we started this podcast, I had no idea Danny Elfman was part of Oingo Boingo. I did not know it. I, I know he did the music for Forbidden Zone, which uh, was directed by his brother. And, you know, that was Danny Elfman's first film was for Forbidden Zone. It was such a weird movie. I'm not going to lie. That is just really out I've there. never watched it. I, I've only seen bits and pieces of it. I, to me, it's one of those movies that you would have to take acid and go watch. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> And and Danny Elfman was actually in the film. He played um, the Satan character, and he did his own version of the Cab Calloway song, Minnie the Moocher. Yeah, he, uh, he said that he was self-taught. I was reading a Rolling Stones interview they did with him. Um, because back in 95, he did a bunch of, uh, he did a Tim Burton compilation. And uh, so they were interviewing him for that. Um, but he said that he was self-taught as far as, uh, you know, uh, transcribing music uh, writing music. Um, he said it was, uh, but he was a street, he he considered himself a street musician. So, um, I can see that you self-taught. So, yeah, well, you say he was self-taught and, you know, from what I gather, like early, er, you know, when he was very young, he exhibited an aptitude for science. He had no interest in music at all, and he was even rejected from the elementary orchestra. Now, first off, what kind of elementary has an orchestra? <laughs> uh, not down south. No. <laughs> well, actually, when I, I when I read this, when, when I read this, I'm like, wait, what? An orchestra? What did they have? Kazoo's? No, no, no. <laughs> orchestra. You know, orchestras anything with a string? No, no, stringed no, no. instruments. I, um, I I think I read somewhere where he plays the violin. Maybe he does play a stringed instrument. No, he um, plays a violin and um, a trombone and what else? I think it was piano. He does vocals also. You know, yeah, and fantastic singer. I did like I said, did not know. Well, he was because singing. he was an Oingo Boingo. Exactly, <laughs> and like I said, I growing up I never knew this about Danny Elfman. I mean, the the main thing I knew Danny Elfman from was Beetlejuice and Batman. So when Naturally, when you think of Danny Elfman, you think of what? Well, it, before this exercise, when I thought of Danny Elfman, I thought of whimsy, whimsical. Um, because, you know, anytime you see a Tim Burton movie, more than likely Danny Elfman is attached to it. Um, you know, I think of Beetlejuice. I think of Batman. I think of those movies. But then, you know, as we started this exercise for the showcase, I have realized that his... His range is humongous. He doesn't just do whimsical stuff. So, right. I think of whimsy at first. Yeah, yeah, and that was that was me too. And he, it was always this one rhythm, boom, 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 boom. He he always had that type of style. It was fantasy, whimsical, very fun. But now I would think it was uh, 1998. There is a film. And it was it had uh, John Travolta in it. He was playing a lawyer, and it was I want to say it was after uh, maybe before Pulp Fiction. John Travolta was kind of in a slump of movies. It was called a Civil Action. I, I remember sitting there watching the movie, and I'm like, okay, it, it, the the movie was not bad from what I remember. And then when it came up, music by Danny Elfman, I was like, wait, the Beetlejuice guy? No, <laughs> Sorry, the Beetlejuice guy. <laughs> And right then and there, it was a stereotype. Danny Elfman was known for whimsical fantasy, not something serious like that film there. And I remember the music being, you know, one of the things that kind of well captured me. You know, and it goes back to what his first uh, his first score was, which was Forbidden Zone. I'm mean, talking about his first big score. I was going to get to that now. All right, so <laughs> we talked about you know Forbidden Zone was his first film, and now in 1985. 
Tim Burton, a very young Tim Burton, and Paul Rubens approached him to score Pee Wee's Big Adventure. See, so you hear Pee Wee's Big Adventure, you hear this whimsical music, and it's just it's stuck with Elfman. You know, you think of Elfman, you think of whimsy. Right. Yeah. And and that score is it had the influence of a Nina Rota, which you know we talked about in one of our last showcase for Honey I Shrunk the Kids, which James Horner used as an influence for the main theme. Uh, immediately when I played you the the first track off of Pee Wee's Big Adventure, you said, "Oh wow, that's Honey I Shrunk the Kids." No. That's Pee Wee's Big Adventure. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> yeah, it sounded very similar. Granted, I haven't seen Pee Wee's Big Adventure in forever. The last time I saw it, because for years I did not know Tim Burton directed it, and when I saw it again, I was like, "Man, this seems like Tim Burton. This is so weird and out there." And all of a sudden, next thing I know, directed by Tim Burton. My brother and I loved it. We we used to watch it all the time, and you know his favorite parts, the Francis. You know he just thinks Francis is hilarious. So you know we used to sit there and watch it. Now Tim Burton and Paul Rubens were fans of Oingo Bongo when they approached him. And they were. Now, yeah, and Tim Burton had no idea that Danny Elfman could not score for like a big orchestra and that he had never done it. He just assumed that he could just do it. Well, yeah, I think there was a, it was another interview that I was reading with uh, Danny Elfman. And he said that when Tim Burton approached him, uh, he's like, you can do it. I know you can. (laughs) And and that's, that's, that's pretty cool that, you know, Tim had that kind of trust in him. He had that kind of, you know, thought you can do this. And, uh, from what I read, Elfman was very nervous at first because he was going to be scoring with an orchestra and everything else. And that's when he got his friend, uh, one of the band members from Oingo Boingo, Steve Bartek, which they still work together to he helped him with the arrangement and everything else. And then what was it? The quote that Elfman was known for when he started to score it, he just said, F it. That's right. <laughs> and, and he said, that's been his philosophy through it. He's like, what can they do? Kill me. <laughs> <laughs> it's funny and now in 1988 Danny Elfman came back for a big top peewee um I couldn't really find the score but I'm you know I, I from what I remember I don't think it had the same and I haven't seen that in for a- uh, forever yeah, I, I forever to, I used to love peewee's playhouse and everybody like loved peewee I just I don't understand the concept of the head in the fish tank was it fish tank or the doors, the head behind the doors, the genie head. Yeah, that was weird. Genie. Was genie was his name? I, yeah, I, I think can't. so. <laughs> I, I really think so. Just a head. Yeah. <laughs> it made no sense. Now, one thing that was kind of interesting, in 1986, he performed, uh, it was for the Onka Bongo album, Dead Man's Party. They performed the song uh, in the film, Back to School, which Danny Elfman scored i love back to school i i was like what rodney dangerfield he did that what yeah he... so you're telling me that there was a background band in one of the the, the scenes there was a background band singing i think and that was oingo boingo was it I, I hadn't seen that movie in a while i know that uh, when he was talking about weird science uh, i think it was with huff post he said that it was embarrassing <laughs> for weird science he said because you for know the music video well, yeah, he said because he was Oingo Boingo, you know, um, as I mentioned, he was an active participant in, you know, making the, the, the videos. He said, but at that time he started composing and he didn't have time to, you know, plan out uh, a, a video. And so he's like, whatever, I'll just, I will be in it. He said, and then looking back on it, it was stupid. <laughs> he said it was embarrassing. He said, then he turns on Beavis and Butthead one day, and there he is. <laughs> like, I'm like, go. Oh, they're watching on TV. <laughs> and he says, serves me right. Well, um, it was in 1979 is when Elf, Danny Elfman kind of took over from Richard for Oingo Boingo, and he kind of kept going like that. And then it was in 90, 1980s, it become a more... Oh, wait, I'm sorry. Excuse me. It was in 1994. He shifted into more of a guitar-oriented rock sound for Ingo Boingo. Well, I guess, think about it. The 80s sounds at the beginning of the 80s, mid-80s, before, you know, before the, you know, the late 80s was more synth, synth pop, um, you know, 
think about aha you know they we we talked about that before with the um with Fultemeyer and his his sound that he created for Beverly Hills Cop um you know he was just he kind of fell in that type of genre where they made it the synth music um and it was really big and so, which we even talked about there was a song in Beverly Hills Cop that Denny Elfman you know performed and in 1995, he retired Oingo Boingo with a series of five sold-out concerts. Uh, now, I think it was in 2003, uh, him and Steve Bartek did come back for The Nightmare Before Christmas in concert, which I would have loved to have seen, but sadly yeah, and he said that he had to, to leave Oingo Boingo because of his hearing. He said all those years of being in that type of band, he said his hearing was on a decline and he didn't want to injure it any more than what it's already been injured. Right. Um, he said, but performing like the Nightmare Before Christmas concert you just mentioned, he said it was a little bit different performing in an orchestra standing. It wasn't t- as hard on his ears. He right. could kind of handle a little bit better. So, you know, at the, by that time, I think... Other than you know him trying to do his music composition uh, uh, type of stuff and transition, it was it was hard for him, and I can I can see that because the years that I've played in the orchestra and the band has really affected my hearing. Well, all the years of me making music over the time and, and messing with different bass bass frequencies and stuff has damaged my hearing as well. So yeah, I I can I can, I can understand I can fully understand. Yeah, and I, I don't blame him. Now, in 1989 is when Danny Elfman's career kind of took a big shift. It was, he was, you know, like we talked about, he was known for Beetlejuice, Pee-wee's Big Adventure, Big Top Pee-wee, stuff like that. But that's when Tim Burton approached him to score Batman. Now, that was kind of a big deal because the studio was not very keen on having Danny Elfman score those because he was known for the comedic elements. He was known for that type of, he wasn't known for a superhero. They wanted John Williams, you know, bigger name who was more known for something like that. Yeah. You know, I, I did read about Batman and um, he said that when he sat down to, to do Batman, they, they wanted him to collaborate with uh, the pop stars. Now, if you remember Prince had a Batman album, right? Where he did some music for Batman, um, and he felt like that wouldn't be good for the movie or true for the movie, and so he's like, "Okay, I, I I'm not going to work with a pop star. I'm not." He said, "Not because he didn't respect the the stars that he mentioned. He said because he did. He just felt like it would not be uh, good for the movie, right. as far as the composition is concerned." And uh, he said that he sat down and he had. Um, he said uh, there were demos set up. Uh, and that he played uh, when they called him back in to play the demo. Um, he, you know, uh, Tim Burton's like, no, play the theme, you know, play it, play the march, play the march, play the march. <laughs> that's right. And so when he went to go play the march, at that point they're like, okay, we made a good decision. Yes, you know, we, we it was uh, John Peters, mm-hmm. the producer. He, he he was very against having Danny Elfman on yes. board. And then when Danny Elfman played the march, that's when John Peters actually stood up was just like. He fully supported it. him. He said, we're going to do something we've never done. You know, we don't normally do. We're going to have two soundtracks because this music is amazing. And it really is. It was a fantastic score. And it was the one thing that really brought that film together was Danny Elfman's theme, for, you know, his gothic st- style for that character. And I remember playing that theme in school. I, we were doing a, na, 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 na. a compilation it was a movie compilation, and I remember Batman being one of the the, the movie the the songs in that compilation. And I think uh, Superman Superman was part of that compilation. Oh, okay. Yeah, we played we played. It was very interesting uh, concert that year. <laughs> but yeah, the original Superman. Okay. Um, this with, uh, John uh, Williams. Yes, we played that, and then of course we played Raiders of the Lost Ark. Well, March, his Ark. dark gothic style. Carried over into Warren Beatty's Dick Tracy, uh, Sam Raimi's Dark Man, and Clive Barker's Nightbreed. Yeah, I was not a very good Dick Tracy fan. It was like, yeah, I was excited when it came out because, you know, I was all into the comic stuff and then I started watching it and I'm like, mm, I don't really like this. I remember liking it as a kid, but after I watched it again, like years later, it's hokey. I'm like, it really is very hokey. <laughs> it's now, really hokey. I did work with one of the actors, uh, R.G. Armstrong. He was he was one of the the mobsters in the movie. Super nice guy. He was uh, sadly he passed away, but um, 
full of stories. I mean, he How really did you work w- with him? Uh, it was a movie. God, I was 15. I was a PA. I it didn't know any that movie. The, it was that movie. <laughs> it was called The Waking. Now it was renamed the keep. It was renamed Keeper of Souls. And um, I remember uh, it was like a big deal on set. Like you know, oh, R. R. G. Armstrong's coming. I'm like, who is R. G. Armstrong? I've never even heard of this person. So we went home, and he was like, oh, he was in Predator. He was in Predator. I'm like, Predator. So I remember meeting him, and you know, like I said, super nice gentleman. He really was. And then we went. It was uh, me and my friend Brandon. We went home uh, that night, and we put in Predator. And there he was giving. He was the general giving Arnold Schwarzenegger and Carl Weathers their mission at the very beginning. I'm like, oh my god, that's him. That is amazing. You know, and it's, like I said, <laughs> super nice guy. So you know, again, you know, it, it was kind of cool. You've got connections. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, I, you I got scored. indirect connections to Danny Elf. It's like six degrees of Kevin Bacon. <laughs> <laughs> That's true. Uh, now, in 1996, Danny Elfman scored Mission Impossible. Uh, now, originally, the composer was Alan Silvestri. And uh, from what I remember, Silvestri scored, you know, almost more than half of the film before he was ultimately let go. Now, I have listened to the unreleased score by Silvestri on that film, and it just, it, it, did not sound good. I didn't know that they released the unreleased score. <laughs> it's not released. It oh. was. It was. Um, well, then, how did you hear it? If it, it was, was on not YouTube, released? I found it somehow. I don't know how this person got it. I don't know if Sylvester put it out or what. But I, I, I was listening to it, and it's got that Sylvester style, and it's got the you know Mission Impossible, and also in this very eighty sounding electric guitar comes out of nowhere, right in the middle of the score, and I'm like, oh no. Whereas Danny Elfman has kind of his own style, but he brought in Lilo Schifrin's original, you know, Mission Impossible theme. That's right. So uh, Elfman is, and you can hear this throughout any of the music that he's composed, uh, he's a respecter of uh, other musical work. And he will oftentimes, uh, you know, will reference themes in his music if they exist, um, like the Mission Impossible theme. So you already had, you know, that, that musical tone that was kind of, you know, established for Mr. Impossible when it came out. So he kind of referenced it. Uh, and you can hear that in his later works, too, which Chris is going to talk about. Um, well, we'll talk about that a little bit later. One of the scores that he's been listening to uh, besides this, that was Danny Elfman's score, in which Danny Elfman had uh, taken those themes and uh, put put them in his music. He, he's respecter of that, you know, sort of thing. Now, you mentioned Weird Science. Now, in 1997, he scored Flubber, which was directed by John, written and directed by John Hughes, who wrote, uh, I believe he wrote and directed Weird Science. John but, Hughes. I know. We uh, all love John Hughes. Exactly. I mean, who doesn't? Uh, I mean, the he was only, really big. Yeah. And, but I thought it was kind of a cool. I, I don't know if it was because John Hughes is such a big fan or if it's just the right timing or because it was such more of a fantasy film. So he got Danny Elfman involved. I'm, I, I don't know. But uh, it was around 1998 um, when Danny Elfman started making more of a shift into a different style. It wasn't the whimsical and fantasy. He did Simple Plan for Sam Raimi, A Civil Action, and Instinct which was, you know, not the fantasy whimsical style. The the one film that stood out for me that really told me rather than or Danny Elfman was a different type of composer was The Next 3 Days in 2010. That had such a vastly different style than Danny Elfman. I mean, it was super serious, very action oriented, very dramatic sound. And it was very calculated, very, very, like I said, a very serious tone. Well, I didn't pick up on that one when I was listening uh, to his work. The ones that I've picked up on that uh, didn't sound the typical, you know, whimsical uh, sound that we discussed uh, at the beginning of the podcast was uh, Dolores Claiborne. Yes, in which they just released a deluxe edition on uh, Spotify. And that score, to me, is a wonderful score. Um, the excerpts that I listened from Dolores Claiborne, 
did not did not read Danny Elfman to me at all. Um, and then the other one that I listened to that didn't read Elfman was uh, Good Will Hunting. Uh, yeah, and when you started playing, I was like, that sounds like James Horner. And you're like, oh, no, that's Danny Elfman. That's Good Will Hunting. I'm like, yeah, what? Yeah, Good Will Hunting. But, well, that's because he he had a he has a very good working relationship with Gus Van Sant. Yes, and he uh, he repeats uh, he does repeat work with him. Um, you know, so his compositions are wide ranged, and uh, his influences include rock, blues, big band music, jazz, operetta, which we see in um, the Nightmare Before Christmas. You know, with the singing, right. uh, funk, hip hop, folk. Like Big Fish is kind of folkish, uh, indie rock, Americana, which Big Fish is kind of Americana also, uh, minimalism, Goodwill Hunting sort of, atonal and experimental. Oh. That's all of the elements that he uses for his his compositions. Uh, the other thing that uh, I noted that um, he loves native instruments. So, for example, uh, when he wrote. Uh, scores that had some African uh, feel to them. He used those African instruments that they would use uh, in Africa. So he's very he's very intelligent when he sits down and starts composing music, and he thinks about all these things. He thinks about you know former themes. He thinks about okay, you know what culture is this from? If this is from you know is it a worldly culture? Um, but he's very thoughtful about the process that he goes through when he starts to compose. Now, we, we've been kind of dancing around it. Let's just go ahead and start talking about The Nightmare Before Christmas. The, the man wrote all the songs, all the lyrics. He wrote the score. And he also was the singing voice for Jack Skellington. Yeah, and I did not know that until a few years ago, and we were watching it. I can't remember if it was around Halloween time or Christmas time we were watching it, but we were watching it, and you're like, you know Danny Elfman sang. And I'm like, what? Because to me, the singing voice is so much similar to the speaking voice of Jack Skellington. Which the speaking voice is uh, Chris Sarandon. But to me, they sound. I thought it was the I, same person. That was that was me. I thought it was the same person. But Danny Elfman uh, was the singing voice for Jack Skellington, but he was also the voice for the tearaway uh, face clown, the creepy clown. Oh god, that clown! So that that movie was awesome. I, I remember watching it in theaters and just loving every minute of it. Like this is so. It's gothic. one of my sister's favorite too. I, I love that movie. Now, Danny Elfman. Uh, was you know known for you know Batman a lot of superhero films so when Spider Man was coming around and Sam Raimi chose Danny Elfman it was you know a surefire fit I mean and that score again it was a it was a great uh, superhero theme for Spider Man had a lot of there were some whimsical moments in there but I mean Sam Raimi has that whimsical style but unfortunately during Spider Man two there was a falling out between Sam Raimi and Danny Elfman. And now I have a quote here. It was from IndieWire.com. And Danny Elfman said, It's like my connection with Sam got completely severed. As far as I'm concerned, he went to sleep. Somebody put a pod next to him. And when he awoke, he wasn't the same person I've known for a decade. He went from right there, number two on my list of favorite directors, to the exact opposite of what I look for in a film experience. Everything I could do on Spider-Man 1, I couldn't do on Spider-Man 2. He got so intensely attached to the music that I couldn't even adapt my own music close enough. It's the first time I've ever walked away from a director in 20 years. I'd rather go back to waiting tables than do Spider-Man 2 again to have the same experience again ouch yeah ouch i have no idea what happened there, that there, does not sound pleasant at all well there have been so many rumors that sam raimi wanted uh christopher young he wanted that style of christopher young as danny elfman told him i'm not christopher young it goes back to what we've discussed before where when you compose yourself and are like oh i want this to sound like this and you're like no i'm chris lott right I am not this person. I can't make my music well, sound like as this. As far as I know, I think Christopher Young did some additional music on the film. I, I can't confirm that because I'm I'm friends with another composer who has worked with Christopher Young, and he, he said he claims that you know he and Young did some additional. Now, like I said, I can't confirm none of this. So if you find something, let us know. It's hearsay. Uh, but Christopher Young did score uh, the gift for Sam Raimi. 
And then he scores Spider-Man 3 and Drag Me to Hell because, like I said, Raimi and Elfman did have a falling out. Now, they did patch things up, and Danny Elfman worked with Sam Raimi again on Oz the Great and the Powerful. Not the greatest film in the world. I mean, it was it was okay. I don't remember watching that one. It had James Franco in it. No, I didn't watch that one. <laughs> I, th- I thought we did. I can't remember. I don't think so. But they are working again on the upcoming Doctor Strange and the Multiverse. I'm excited of... about that. You know what? I am I to an Doctor extent. Doctor Strange. I am to an extent because I really loved Michael Giacchino's score for the first film. I, I really loved it. And I, as we just talked about how Danny Elfman does you know, keep themes when he does a sequel to a film that he didn't score the first one. He does keep the theme. So I hope he keeps that same theme. That he will. I, I, hope so. I think there's, there's only been a handful of times where he hadn't transferred the theme over. And I, off the top of my head, I can't remember which movies those are, but there, there's a handful of them. Um, but because I think it's such a, a huge movie franchise, he will keep the same theme. It'd be so. kind of ridiculous if he didn't. And he knows that he's now, a pretty intelligent fellow. Themes is something that Danny Elfman is really, really known for. Like, again, Batman, Beetlejuice. Let's talk about the one that we've been dancing around. Yep. So there is one theme that he created in one day. That's right. That one he day. said will be on his tombstone that he created the theme for The Simpsons. One day. I, that was just awesome. And, and what's really cool was with The Simpsons movie, Hans Zimmer really incorporated the theme that Danny Elfman created into the score and I uh, I thought that was cra- crazy that he did it one day I never knew that he did the Simpsons really yeah because I did not pay attention I was totally oblivious to that fact and it's so Danny Elfman too. until like you know about 20 minutes ago and I'm started <laughs> reading my list of notes that I wrote down I'm like wait a minute the Simpsons yep he did the Simpsons and it was uh Tales from the Crypt uh, around the same what? time what yeah. He, he did Tales from the Crypt. You didn't know that? No. <laughs> yeah, he did Tales from the Crypt. That was I Daniel. used to love watching Tales from the Crypt. Da, 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 da. You know, and it had the the the, the boys choir that he, you know. <laughs> I love that. <laughs> I love it. It was, a, it was a great, great theme, and it, it worked so well with that introduction, which they, I love for the movies, they just kept the same introduction, same music, everything. Just now, straight that from you, the, now that you mention it, I can, yeah, that, that does sound a lot like Elfman. Yeah. It does. It, it does. Was great. <laughs> so <laughs> I did, I, you know, uh, I know this is your showcase, but I did kind of record uh, a few of the movies down that he uh, scored that, you know, uh, we hadn't discussed because some of them to me, I was like, wow, I, I didn't realize that until I started to go back and, and listen. Uh, one of them was Army of Darkness. I was not, I did not know that he scored that one. Well, he didn't score it. Uh, Joseph LaDuca, which is Sam Raimi's uh, go to composer for A- Evil Dead, Evil Dead 2, Army of Darkness, and Ash vs. Evil Dead, the TV series. Uh, Danny Elfman came in and uh, created the March of the Dead theme, which because they had a working, I uh, had a really good working relationship on Dark Man, so that was I, I knew about that, and something about that. Glad you brought that up. Was um, kind of interesting because watching Army of Darkness, you see an actress working with Bruce Campbell that you never would even thought of seeing these two together, Bridget Fonda. <laughs> Now, why am I bringing up Bridget Fonda? Because that is Danny Elfman's wife. Now, seeing Bridget Fonda in Army of Darkness, I'm going. I, I remember watching it the first time. I'm like, she's a big actress. Why isn't you know? Why isn't the focus? Why isn't her name out there with Bruce Campbell's name? What's going on here? I don't understand this. Now, I don't know if it was Danny Elfman was dating her at the time or what. Or that's how they met, or whatever else. But I mean, there's too big of a coincidence right there to, you know. <laughs> too big of a coincidence. <laughs> wink, wink. <laughs> Such oddness going on. <laughs> well, we are talking about Danny Elfman. <laughs> well, now he did Army of Darkness. He did, you mentioned Back to School. I love that movie. Rodney Dangerfield is such a funny guy. Is that, that, that has Robert Downey Jr. Right? Yes. Okay. And, uh, my favorite scene 
was when uh, Rodney Dangerfield was going to do the dive. He was, you know, he was supposed yeah. to be a dive master. He was, you know, he won all these awards diving, and he gets up there and he does the armpit farty, you know, thing up <laughs> yep. there, and he puts his finger up in the air. <laughs> I love it, I, but I love Rodney Dangerfield. So, um, I was surprised that he did back to school. Uh, Big Fish, which we mentioned, uh, Batman, which we mentioned. Dolores Claiborne, which we mentioned, uh, Goodwill Hunting. Now, Dolores Claiborne and Goodwill Hunting, it doesn't have that whimsical sound that Elfman typically, you know. Neither does Big Fish. It, it, no. I mean, there were there were moments in there, but the the majority of the score was not whimsical. Not at all. Um, but he did Red Dragon. I love that score. And with Red Dragon, he kind of paid homage to the... Uh, he took that theme and reworked it in the film that was in Silence of the Lambs. Um, so, uh, you know, he was respect, you know, respectful of that. Um, now, you're talking about Red Dragon. Now, he worked with Brett Ratner, the director, on Red Dragon. There was a show I was watching one time before, and it was Brett Ratner sitting there talking about the importance of film score in, in a movie. And he had Lilo Schifrin and Danny Elfman sitting there. Now, Lilo scored um, Rush Hour 1, 2, and 3 for Ratner, and Danny Elfman scored Red Dragon and um, I believe it was called The Family Man starring Nicolas Cage. Ooh, Lilo, that one. <laughs> yeah, it was all right. But um, Lilo Schifrin got up on the piano and started playing right there on the show, started playing the theme for Rush Hour, and Ratner and Elfman were just sitting there, like, smiling the whole time. And when Schifrin finished, Elfman goes, I can't do that. I can't get over there and just start playing it live like that. And he goes, i got to have a computer or something. He said, that was amazing. <laughs> I, thought it, I thought it was great. That, that Schif- you know. And then, you know, Elfman, you know, scored Mission Impossible, which was Schifrin's theme. That's what Schifrin was mainly known for. So, yeah, when you, when you, when you mentioned Red Dragon and – you know, Elfman and Ratner's, you know, another director they works with a lot. Uh, a score to Red Dragon was awesome. It was awesome. I, I listened to, uh, of course, excerpts because there's so much material to cover for a showcase. And the excerpts that I listened to, you know, I'm like, well, this is a horror movie. And granted, you know, uh, what's his face? Hannibal Lecter is... You Anthony know, Hopkins. You know, kind of quirky character anyway. Yeah. And so I could see, you know, Elfman's tie to this just by thinking about the subject matter. Not the fact that it's a horror movie, but say, you know, thinking about how, uh, you know, Hannibal Lecter uh, ha- was written. So, um, but yeah, that was a phenomenal score. Not typical whimsy or, fan- uh, you know, uh, fantasy-like. Um, he did Real Steel. Yeah, which was a really different one because there was a lot of synthesized, action-oriented uh, score. I mean, it had some lighthearted moments in there, but there, the, the score also paid a lot of homage to uh, Bill Conti's score to Rocky. Yeah. Because, I mean, it it is a very Rocky-inspired film. It's a robot, you know... Boxer! Boxer, and... <laughs> uh, well, it, it it was a it was an underdog story basically, just like Rocky was. So, uh, of course, Elfman's going to bring in that underdog sound. Yeah, you know, when I listened to it, I and uh, instantly picked up on the synth, and I'm like, oh yeah, you know, it's kind of like Oingo Boingo days with the synthesizers. I said he's good at this, but uh, no, it, it it it's it's a really good score. If y'all haven't listened to it, now there's one I purposely did not mention yet because i know you were just listening to it and it is the alice in wonderland score when that because whenever we do a showcase um we we go through spotify and they have a selection is like this is so and so um so i listened to the you know this is danny elfman of course you know it had uh, a lot of the Corpse Bride on there, which was the spiritual successor to spiritual sequel to Nightmare Before Christmas. I mean, it, not really sequel, I guess. It was more of the same style. It had the claymation stop motion by Henry Selick and his team, and Danny and uh, Tim Burton. But um, which was it was okay score. But it had a lot of Nightmare Before Christmas, Corpse Bride, and it went Spider Man, Spider Man Two. And then uh, when Alice came up, I'm like, oh, okay, it's another fantasy. And it started up with the Alice, Alice's theme. 
and the choir come in there like okay another you know elfman trait you know the choir come in there and then they started singing and i was like wait a minute typically the choir doesn't have vocals in the elfman score and it started you know with the alice oh alice i was like this is fantastic this is a great <laughs> score i mean oh wow and i I just want to kick myself for not listening to the whole score. It is score. a good score. I liked it. I liked it when it first came out. And there was another um, another theme that he did that it uh, when the film came out, it was the the Charlie and Chocolate Factory. Oh yes. Or was it Willy Wonka? I can't remember the it's name. It's Charlie of it. and the Chocolate Factory. Was it that was the that was the name of it? I don't know if the the remake has a different name. I think the remake has a different name. But it's Charlie and Chocolate Factory. Yeah, I mean, everybody knows what I'm talking about. Yeah, Charlie and the Chocolate Factory. It was yeah. the, the Johnny Depp one, the weird one. But the theme for that did not sound like a kid's movie. It sounded like something that would fit for a horror film. I like Charlie and the Chocolate Factory score. That's one of my go-to scores. If I'm just, you know, I haven't decided what I wanted to listen to, I'll either put that one on or I'll put Sleepy Hollow on. Wonderful use of theremin in Charlie Chocolate Factory. I mean, it was just, I love that score. Let's briefly talk about Mars Attacks, because he does use a theremin in Mars Attacks. And uh, I read uh, where he purposely used a theremin in Mars Attacks because he grew up listening, watching those sci-fi movies in the 50s and the 60s, and, you know, they use the theremin a lot. So uh, he wanted to, to try to capture that sound when he was making that score. You know another score he used the theremin for? What? Was that? Goosebumps. You know, I hadn't really sat down. I watched a movie, but I hadn't sat down and, it, and listened the, to the it. The theme, it, it wasn't... Uh, it, it was a good. It was a good score. I, I've listened to it a couple of times. Um, it, it sounded very Charlie and the Chocolate Factory. I mean, it, but it just didn't have the same spice that Charlie and the Chocolate Factory did. Uh, it, you know, th that score it had, but it, it was still a very enjoyable score. And um, I remember listening to the score for the second Goosebumps film. It was like the composer was trying to do his own thing there for a while, and then he just kind of gave up and used Danny Elfman's theme again. <laughs> Well, I mean, which, you know, yeah, okay. Now, let's get to what I've been listening to um, on top of, you know, Danny Elfman. Which is Danny Elfman. Yeah, which is Danny so Elfman. So he listened to Danny Elfman on top of Danny Elfman with a little <laughs> side of Danny Elfman uh, in his spare time. Yeah. Anyway. <laughs> no, uh, at the time of this recording, like I said, Whenever this episode releases, it's going to be like way, way past. But Zack Snyder's cut of Justice League uh, just released Thursday. And uh, at the time we're recording, this is a Sunday. Uh, it's a four-hour long epic superhero film. Now, there was a lot of controversy for the film because Joss Whedon took over um, due to a lot of studio you know, messing around and Zack Snyder having a um, tragedy happen. And Junkie XL, which is Tom Holkenberg, was supposed to score the film, but he was let go when Joss Whedon took on, took over and they hired Danny Elfman. Now, I believe Danny Elfman only had uh, three weeks, maybe a little longer, to score the film. Oh, my goodness. Yeah. For I, a whole I, feature? Yeah, especially a film of oh that magnitude. Uh, now, he, he did bring on... Uh, Pinar Toprik, a female composer who is really known for scoring Captain Marvel. He, he brought her on to kind of help out and everything else. From what I read, I, you know, I can't confirm this. But Danny Elfman said in an interview, he said, one of the things you're going to hear with this film is you're going to hear Batman's theme. When you see Batman, you're supposed to hear Batman. When you see Superman, you're supposed to hear Superman. So he brought in not only his original Batman theme for Ben Affleck's Batman, but he also brought in John Williams' original theme for Superman, and he brought in the theme for Flash, and he brought in Hans Zimmer and Junkie XL's theme for Wonder Woman. Now, I listened to Danny Elfman's score for Justice League first. I, I was like, well, since we're doing the showcase on Elfman, let me listen to his score for Justice League first. Now, there were moments of the in the score where it had kind of a whimsical feel, but overall it was a very serious, a very solid score. If very, I remember, yeah, it was it's a been great a while score, but it. there were a lot of moments in there where it sounded kind of generic. 
Now, I don't know if it was because he was pressed for time or if it's because the film itself, because the film itself, I will go on right now and say my opinion of the film. It, it is a mess of a film. Well, you know, it could be, too. I, I cannot remember what his his style is to composing. I don't know if he composes it first and then watches it, vice versa. You know, everybody's got a style. Uh, I know your style is um, uh, watching it without sound. So you can try to visualize, you know, where music goes. So it could be, uh, based on his musical style, why it sounds generic. Now, his process is, for a film scores, uh, this is off of Wikipedia, Elfman draws musical inspiration almost exclusively from viewing a cut of the film and occasionally visits the set. Well, I mean, a lot of composers do that. We talked about Christopher Young, you know, in Hard Rain, how he visited on a set. And, like I said, maybe it was his press for time, or maybe, maybe it was just because he couldn't... Maybe it was already filmed... You know, he didn't get to visit the set, so he Maybe. didn't get to see their interactions. Maybe. But there's got to be a reason why it sounds generic. I mean, it, the, it wasn't the entire score was very generic. It was just, it, it was, there were a lot of moments in there where it's like, eh. But there there were moments in there where you get, it had a very Elfman style where it's like, bah, 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 Well, you know, you know I kind of agree with you. Um, you know, my opinion, which we're not going to get into my opinion of the movie. Um, but I did feel like it was all over the place and it that really there was, was no continuity uh, as far as trying to understand uh, the storyline a lot better than what I did. Now, I, I enjoyed the score that Elfman created and everything else, but it was not one of his better scores. Now, then I started listening to the score that Tom Hulkenberg created, and I got to tell you, it was I was really blown away by what he did. I thought, I was like, wow, this is this is intense. It's very aggressive and a lot of percussion and he brought back you know the wonder woman theme that they created him and Hans Zimmer but he also brought in Hans Zimmer's um Superman theme that they created for Man of Steel now Junkie also created a Batman theme in uh, the film Batman v Superman because Hans Zimmer said that Ben Affleck's version of Batman is not the same that he created for uh christian bale's batman because this batman he said is just the the anger was not there so zimmer is like he passed the theme over to junkie xl so junkie xl kept his themes that he created he kept the you know and then him and Hans zimmer created so both films you know by the two different composers they kept themes over for the characters just you know different films and i think that's being respectful you know if i was a composer and i was working on a, a movie that had a theme to it or something was established in the past i would try to bring that back for the fans and i would try to to show that okay i am paying homage to what had been done and now i'm going to take the torch and do something you know and, and creative with it and you know uh elfman was really good he's good at that and uh, he's very as I mentioned, he's very intelligent when he sits down and he and he tries to figure out um, how a piece of music should sound or what needs to go where. And we saw that in Justice League, especially when he started pulling in these these uh, themes that you know he didn't make in the past, uh, and he worked them into the score in a way where um, it sounded amazing because you know it's his score, so he made it work for his score. Um, I did not sit down and, and listen to Junkie XL's score. Uh, I have only experienced it because right now we're still halfway through <laughs> yes. watching the Snyder Cut. Four hours um, and two minutes, and we're a little over two hours. A little two hours, it. but my observation uh, just by watching the movie is that it is more intense. Um, it is um, raw. It's kind of got like a raw sound to it. Um, it's not, uh, like Elfman. You, I mean, it's obviously not like Elfman, but it, it sounds, it sounds to me more intense. It's the only word that I can think of right now. Right. You know? Now you're talking about being respectful of themes. And again, this goes back to what we've been saying now for Avengers age of Ultron, uh, Brian Tyler was originally brought on to score the film. And then, uh, Joss Whedon brought on Danny Elfman to help Tyler, uh, because, there's something going on. I, I don't know the um, 
confirmed story, but there's rumors that Brian Tyler was set to score uh, Furious 7, but the death of Paul Walker shifted, you know, delayed that film. So when the film was set to release, it was uh, messing up with the time schedule for Age of Ultron, which Marvel was not very happy about. And they brought on, um, which Brian Tyler had composed the theme, you know, for the Marvel logo at the time. So Danny Elfman was brought on to kind of help out, and he brought in the Alan Silvestri theme. He kind of worked it into his own new theme, which was like a hybrid theme, but he still brought back Silvestri's theme, which, again, it goes back to Danny Elfman is a very you know, respectful composer of themes and everything else. And like you said, if I scored a sequel to a film that already had a very established theme, yeah, I would bring that theme back. Well, I know you would. Well, well my very first job was in uh, 2003 and it was for a Halloween fan film. And what won the director over was I created my own version of John Carpenter's Halloween theme. And they were like, oh, we're going to use the score to Halloween, but uh, I think we're going to go with you. <laughs> and you're like, thanks. Yeah. <laughs> so Danny Elfman is a very prolific composer. I mean, if you have not listened to Danny Elfman's work, please do so now. I mean... Just pick a score, any score. But also, don't pigeonhole him into a one certain type of composer. Because, a genre. Yeah, one one type of genre, because he's not. He's a very versatile composer. I mean, he's fantastic, which is why we wanted to do a showcase on Danny Elfman. He's one of our favorites. He's within my top three. Yeah, same here. He's he's definitely in my top five. Oh, okay. I see what you did there. Yeah, I went Can't top be five. like your wife. No. No, I'm, I'm not within my top three. He's within my top five. Yeah. I got, uh-huh. I got a different top three. So I see that. He, he's in my top five. Uh huh. <laughs> <laughs> I see what you did there. Yeah. So, guys, thank you so much for listening. As always, you can catch us on social media uh, on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and iHeartRadio. iHeartRadio. Well, no, we didn't get to that one yet. You can send us a message on our email. <laughs> Whoops. Measuring, measuring the score at gmail.com. She's got a little head. I am. I'm sorry. Uh, now, you can listen to us on Spotify, Apple, Podbean, and where else, Leslie? iHeartRadio. There we go. <laughs> Yay, Yay! I did good. <laughs> wow. So, as always, thank you guys so much for listening. For Measuring the Score, I'm Chris. And I'm Leslie. Have a good one. Hey everyone, before we completely close this episode out, I want to give a quick shout out to Corey and Jeff with Switch the Envelope Podcast. We had a ton of fun with those guys talking about which score should have won for the 1982 Academy Awards for Best Original Score. And we had so much fun that the episode ran over three hours long. That's right, we talked way too much. So they had to split it up into two episodes. So keep an ear out for that. I'll have a link for their podcast in the description below. So definitely check those guys out. Switch the Envelope podcast. A ton of fun. Definitely go check them out. And when you do, tell them we sent you. As always, for Measuring the Score, I'm Chris. Have a good one.